are but participants in this worship which Christ offers in our name to the Father through the Holy Spirit. Welcome. We rejoice that we can join together in the worship of the Lord. May this time together in which we lift up corporate prayers of praise, thanksgiving and petition, strengthen us for the challenges we may encounter this week. Let us stand and sing our intro. Come Holy Spirit, fall on me now. to worship is based on Psalm 14 verses 1, 2, and 1 Timothy 1 verses 12, 14, and 17. Fools say in their heart, there is no God, but we rejoice, for our wisdom flows from Jesus, who strengthens us and judges us faithful. God looks in vain to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. But we rejoice, for the lives of the faithful overflow with mercy and grace and the love of Christ himself. Let us worship God who has graciously gifted us with that love. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray our prayer of adoration and praise. Living God, we give thanks for the many blessings you bestow on our lives. The greatest of, this, of these blessings is the way that in Christ, you seek us out and offer us undeserved mercy and love. Such love enriches and enhances our lives in ways that knowledge never could and enables us to accomplish far more than we could ever dream or imagine. We worship and praise you, O oh God, for so blessing our lives. And we pray that all we do and say will bring glory and honor to you and Christ whom we serve. In his name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our hymn of approach and adoration, number 407. Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
be seated. We confess that we are a people unworthy to approach a holy God, but know that Christ is our high priest interceding to the Father for us. A prayer of confession. Merciful God, your joy reflects a love so broad that it enfolds all people. A love that despairs when people, for whatever reason, lose their way in life and feel lost and rejected. Forgive us when we contribute to that despair by our lack of persistence to do as Jesus did, to seek out and save the lost. When we hold on to judgmental attitudes and neglect people, we believe do not measure up to our standards of righteousness, those who are lost faith are not found. When our apathy allows people to remain in the clutches of evil, those who have lost hope are not found. When we falter in our commitment to support those in our society, weakened by poverty and illness, those who have lost a sense of hope are not found. When we fail to welcome or reach out to the stranger, the uprooted, the refugee, those who have lost family and friends, home and even country are not found. We acknowledge most merciful God, the times when your mercy has sought us out in our lostness and picking us up has held us tenderly and rejoiced when we have been healed. Strengthen us with your spirit to reflect the same mercy as we seek to do as Jesus did, to seek out and save those who are lost and to love them as unconditionally as he did. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our assurance of forgiveness is this. The mercy and grace of God overflows in Jesus Christ, who came into this world to save sinners. And so we rejoice that in Jesus Christ, we are found, we are forgiven, we are loved. Thanks be to God. Our children's hymn number 571. Lord, I want to be a Christian. Be seated. 
So at this point, we are connecting with our reformed faith and our Presbyterian movement, taken from the living faith. Beginning this Sunday, each week, we will have excerpts from our doctrinal statement, The Living Faith, to help members to know or recall what we believe. For this week only, consistent with the subject of the Old Testament reading today, we will place the whole first chapter here. It will replace our affirmation of faith. Chapter 1, God. There is one true God, whom to know is life eternal, whom to serve is joy and peace. God has created all that is. The whole universe testifies to the majesty and power of its maker. God has come to us. The Lord spoke to the people of Israel and entered into covenant with them. From Israel came Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bringing salvation through a new covenant entered by faith. The Lord continues to come to us by the Holy Spirit, God present in the world and guide to the church, the new Israel. The church upholds and defends the truth given to the apostles and recorded in the scriptures. The Old and New Testaments witness to God's mighty acts. They reveal the creator's holy love and lead us to Jesus Christ. The creeds of the early church Preserve the faith of the apostles who first preached the gospel of Christ. We receive them as a legacy in which the true interpretation of the scriptures is protected. Therefore, with one church universal, we believe in one God, eternal Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three, equal in power and glory. God is the Father to whom we come, the Son through whom we come, the Spirit by whom we come. We worship Almighty God, the source of all life. With thanks, we acknowledge God's wisdom, power, and faithfulness, and love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. We eagerly listen for a word from you, Lord Jesus Christ, to help us in our daily life and to equip us for the mission to which you have called us. Our hymn of illumination, Ancient Words.
Let us pray our prayer of illumination. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the red word, the Holy Scriptures. Our first reading, Jeremiah 4, 11 to 12 and 22 to 28. The land shall be desolation, the earth shall mourn. Good morning. The time is coming when the people of Jerusalem will be told that a scorching wind is blowing from the desert toward them. It will not be a gentle wind that only blows away the shaft. The wind that comes at the Lord's command will be much stronger than that. It is the Lord himself who is pronouncing judgment on his people. The Lord says, my people are stupid. They don't know me. They are foolish children. They have no understanding. Their experts are doing what is evil, but failures are doing what is good. I looked at the earth. It was barren waste. At the sky, there was no light. I looked at the mountains. They were shaking and the hills were rocking back and forth. I saw that there were no people even the birds had flown away. The fertile land had become a desert. Its cities were in ruins because of the Lord's fierce anger. The Lord has said that the whole earth will become a wasteland, but that he will not completely destroy it. The earth will mourn, the sky will grow dark. The Lord has spoken and will not change his mind. He has made his decision and will not turn back. The word of the Lord. A responsive psalm, number 14. The foolish say there is no God. Fools say to themselves, there is no God. They are all corrupt and they have done terrible things. There is no one who does what is right. The Lord looks down from heaven at us humans to see if there are any who are wise, any who worship him, for they have all gone wrong. They are all equally bad. Not one of them does what is right, not a single one. Don't they know, asked the Lord? Are all these evildoers ignorant? They live by robbing my people and they never pray to me, but then they will be terrified for God is with those who obey him. Evildoers frustrate the plans of the humble, but the Lord is their protection. How I pray that victory will come to Israel from Zion. How happy the people of Israel will be when the Lord makes them prosperous again. The Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning Epistle readings, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Christ came to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost.
Gospel reading, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. The parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And welcomes outcasts and even eats them. So Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. What do you do? You leave the other 99 sheep in the pasture and go looking for the one that got lost until you find it? When you find it, you are so happy that you put it on your shoulders and carry it back home. Then you call your friends and neighbors together and say to them, I am so happy I found my lost sheep. Let us celebrate. In the same way, I tell you, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman who has 10 silver coins loses one of them. What does she do? She lights a lamp, sweeps her house, and carefully looks everywhere until she finds it. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says to them, I am so happy I found the coin I lost. Let us celebrate. And in the same way, I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. It's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. We will now have special music by Richard, followed by today's message from Reverend Dr. James.
faith on the premise that there is a God and that God exists. The scriptures teaches, the scriptures teach us that God loves us. The problem, however, is that although we speak God language, we don't always act as though God does exist. And so Psalm 14, which is going to be the focus for the discussion this morning, begins by saying that the fool says in his heart that there is no God. The Hebrew word for fool here means wicked, vile, or impious. And so the idea that we get here is not so much so that the person is a fool because he or she is stupid in the way we think of fools. But the person is a fool because he or she sins and sinning according to the understanding is the height of folly. Now, this fool says in his heart, there is no God. And, and, and the fool here is not speaking about an individual, but it's speaking about a class of people who would say that God, there is no God. He says, or she says in her heart that there is no God because that's what he or she desires. That is what he or she wishes. So basically, a person who is a fool and says there's no God is the one who wishes that there were no God so that he or she could do what he or she wants without having any consequences. Are you getting me? If there were no God, then there would be no one to bring me to account. Therefore, I want to engage you this morning, first of all, by asking you this. If there were no police, if there were no consequences to you for doing that which would hurt others, including stealing, all manner of, I don't want to use the word wrong, all manner of ill against your neighbor. If you could do those things, get away with it, and nobody's going to hold you to account, regardless of how negatively that impacts the other, would you do it? In other words, if you can go down to sugar and spice and just take all the ice cream and nobody, there's been no one to stop you and no one to hold you to account. And you feel like a nice, like I love Grenada chocolate. I just take the whole container and go with it. Um, if you had the ability to do that without having to answer to anyone and be honest, we have the mic here. Um, would you be the way you are right now, a law-abiding citizen? Good morning. Good morning. Um, Reverend, Reverend James, I wanted to add in the absence of being socialized with a moral compass, if that did not exist, I probably would send someone to, to punch people's tires every now and then. Um, maybe not kill, but do some mischief, yes, I might. Okay, thanks for your honesty. Uh, Derek is gonna pass the mic around in case other people want to, to speak.
Well, Reverend James, we, we all have grown up um, being taught right from wrong, I presume. <laughs> and to an extent, we do know right from wrong. So if we weren't brought up in that way, uh, we may do differently. Exactly. So we are assuming that you are not brought up because there's no right or wrong. You are not socialized that way. John? <clears throat> and I agree with Roseanne. This is how we have been brought up, but we have seen time and again when we have national disasters like hurricanes, that there's a collective insanity. When people do go into these shops and loot them and take things, people who are otherwise peaceful and law-abiding citizens. That's a very good point. Um, I remember me telling you one time that um, when we had was it, um, it, it was not Ivan, it, it was the intervention. And, um, well, might have been, yeah, it was the intervention. And my family was moving. Um, no, it would have been Ivan. Yeah, it would have been Ivan. And then we, there were people looting and we saw some, some soldiers, because we were trying to go to check on Anna's parents and they wouldn't let us pass. They said, because people were looting. And I said, but we are Christians. And the guy says, there were Christians looting. So John, yes. Um, when, if, especially when we are in a crowd and um, we have the advantage of anonymity, we sometimes would do what the crowd does, suspending our own consciences. Now, I am actually going somewhere with this. Yeah? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. There is the argument being made that the atheist who does good is better than the Christian who does good because the atheist, well, let me start with a Christian. The Christian does good because the Christian is afraid of divine retribution or the Christian is doing good so that he or she may be rewarded. However, it is said, and now this is just, statement and you can evaluate it that the atheist does good for nothing in other words the atheist does good for good's sake what do you think of the state Um, I have a lot of friends who are atheists who are exceptional people. So I actually kind of agree with that because they do um, a lot of exceptional things and put themselves in harm's way or at great sacrifice to themselves, take care of Christians in the community that other Christians don't step up to take care of. So it's it's not great when you see that happening as it you know it should be the christians not just because these are people who are part of their own community but also because we should be called to be do more and to be exceptional because that's how we show the world what god's love looks like and we fail at that yeah. very often anybody else Heather? Thank you. I find myself thinking that consequences have to be taken into consideration because if you have an appalling birth and terrible things happen to you, 
you cannot be compared with someone whose parents have taken you to church every Sunday. And I just think <clears throat> there are so many, it's not an excuse, but it's understandable that someone who is not a Christian and even someone who is a Christian should not be judged if, if they have to deal with terrible things and therefore their thinking is affected by what happens to them as well as going to church and things like that. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Sir. Hello, good morning. Pleasant good morning to everyone. Is it on? Yes. Um, I'm getting my spirit eh? that we can be a Christian in two categories. One, you can be a Christian in the human flesh of yourself, or you can be a, a Christian in the spirit of yourself. And there are two different persons standing in two in the different shoes. You can be a Christian in the flesh, or you can be a Christian in the spirit. That's all I have to say. Okay, thanks. Can a Christian do good without the prospect of reward or the fear of retribution? The atheist supposedly does it for nothing. No reason. Can the Christian do it for no reason? Or should the Christian do it for no reason? Let me just add to that. Um, hmm? Who's a Christian? Um, well, there are different definitions of Christian depending on where you are, but the definition of Christian that we use is one who at a particular point in history made a decision to surrender his or her life to Christ and to live his or her life from that point on serving him. That's the definition of Christian. There's another national definition of Christian so you talk about Christian and um, Jews or, you know, when you differentiate in different sects. So you may say, um, you, this is a Christian country. And a lot of Grenadians would say they are Christian because they are, all right. You know, like you're from Grenada, so you're Grenadian. You're in a Christian country, so you're a Christian. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the Christian who models his or her life on Christ, as we are told in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following, um, that we are to imitate Christ. We need to have Christ as our example. Reverend James, there, um, yes, I agree with you. We know that that's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and yet you have those people who feel to be a Christian, you have to dress a certain way, you have to look dowdy, you can't smile, and you know, you just have to act, put on an act. And yet you go to church and you start to criticize the person who was sitting in front of you for whatever reason. But I'll tell you, this or last week there was a story in the papers about a homeless man who found a wallet full of money and gave it to the police. As a Christian, I don't know where he came from. Maybe he was, he was brought up right. And, but certainly he had that thing called conscience. So he knew it wasn't his. Okay. And that's a Christian. Any other? Now, I'm still on the concept of the fool saying in his heart, there is no God. The argument is being made that an atheist cannot be more moral unless there is something innate within him or her that causes him or her to do good. 
In other words, from where do the virtues of kindness, honesty, and so forth originate? If an atheist believes primarily in the naturalistic order, evolution, from where do these qualities come? So the argument is that even though one may say he or she is an atheist, by the very fact he or she is doing what is good is evidence that God exists because he or she has those qualities hardwired in him or her by the one who made him or her. What do you think of this argument? It is not that the atheists cannot do good, but that the, he or she is doing good because it's innately part of who he or she is. And that is used as evidence that God does exist. I have said before that many of us are guilty of practical atheism in, in that even though we may say that we believe in God, if we live our lives without the influence of God, then we are for all practical purposes, atheists, for we live in as though God does not exist. Are you with me? So we say God exists, but if we live as though God were not existing, then for all practical purposes, God does not exist in our lives. Therefore, we are, practically speaking, atheists. In verse 2 of chapter 14, we are told that, um, let me see, God is looking down and seeking those who are wise as to whether or not they would worship God. And so what I am contending is that you cannot really know God and not worship God. You may believe God exists. Sorry, there's a difference between believing God exists and believing that there is a God. Oh, let me put it another way. There is a difference in believing in God and believing that there is a God. To believe that there is a God only requires observation, and this is primarily intellectual and a process of logic. Nothing self-generates. Do you know that? <clears throat> if there is nothing, can nothing give life to something? <clears throat> so for there to be something some being had to exist who always existed and then gave life to everything that is. That's the only logical conclusion. I find it takes more faith to believe in the naturalistic view of evolution than it does to believe in a God. So if you want to call God the first cause, fine. But there must not be anyone existing before God. God always existed. And everything else that exists, exists because God exists. And so in, in confirmation class, 
the 11 year old, 12 year old, 13 year old, who is not afraid to ask questions that many adults would not ask. So, I was going to have a mother. And I've been asked that. And so if you say, yes, God has a mother, then does God have a grandmother? If God has a grandmother, does God have a great grandmother? Are you getting my point? That you keep going back and back and back and back and you never stop. So there has to be a point where there existed one who always existed. Otherwise, are you, are you, are you getting the point? And so I like to believe that first cause is God. So I'm saying, you may intellectually believe that there is a God and that's different from believing in God. And if you believe in God, you will worship God. The word worship no. comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning worship, that God is worthy of worship. And if you conceptualize of God, creator, you want to worship God. And it's not easy to believe that. I have watched, I have not been, I have watched how people have swooned, how they have screamed at the top of their voices. They have fainted when Michael Jackson appeared on the stage. And you see in that kind of contemporary worship of others because they are larger than life. So if you really believe that God is not only larger than life, but God is the creator of life, then you would worship God. Yes, you go to I close with the, unless you have any comments. The fool here is wishing there were no God because he or she wants to do what he or she wants to do. I have, no, Maria, but I have, the scripture okay. says, but God not, does it. And God is going to bring have. to account all those. Sorry, sorry, all so have, now. Any closing comments from you? Many. And then I have lunch any time. Okay. I don't know. Um, Thanks for I, 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 creating my daughter, but in a dynamic way my summon this morning. Um, Thank you, Reverend James. <laughs> we respond with thanksgiving through commitment of ourselves and giving of tithes and offerings. Our hymn of response, number 477, Your hand, O God, has guided. Oh, oh. 
Please be seated. At this time, we will collect our offering. Downstairs to wash. Eh? I'm going to bring the dishes to wash. I am. Um, I'm going downstairs with the dishes. for him. God of grace and truth, you touch our lives with extravagant mercy, and we offer these gifts in response to such generosity. We pray that we may be bearers of a like mercy and grace in all our dealings with people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, please be seated. We take our prayers to the Father who is always willing to hear us through Christ, our high priest and mediator in the power of the Holy Spirit, our enabler and guide. Can we have family updates? So first of all, um, Brenda Williams passed and um, we would like to extend our condolences to the entire family. She was here with us just what, two weeks before. Okay, Roseanne, have happy family time. Okay, so Johan has a birthday on Tuesday. Any birthdays? Any other birthdays? You have a birthday? Well, first of all, welcome to our worship. Good to have you with us and we will sing you and Johan happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Okay. Let us pray our prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of the people. Are there any testimonies, by the way? Okay, let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus through whom we come to you and for the gift of the Holy Spirit that enables us to so do. We thank you that we can call you father. We can call you brother, our friend, our partner, that we can have a personal relationship with you. We love you, Lord, and we worship you. We thank you for all of our blessings, the food on our tables, the roof over our heads, our creature comforts, our jobs, our family and friends, our staff and all the various people who help us to function. God, we thank you for the dawn of each new day, for nights when we can rest and days when we can work or play or learn. Thank you for our senses, 
and the gift of appreciation for all the beauty around us. We lift to you, Lord, our world, the causes for climate change and the effects on our weather system. We ask your protection from hurricanes and other natural disasters this year. We lift to you our nation, our new government, and all that they must do. We pray for our children as they have started school, our elderly, and those who mourn. We especially remember the Williams family. We lift to you our church, our need for growth in numbers and completion of our structure and its surrounds. We lift to you each and every member. And we ask that your will will be done in our lives. We thank you for those who do so much to keep things going. And we pray for those who have yet to volunteer their gifts and service. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. having heard your word to us to make a difference in our communities and the world. Our hymn of sending forth, number 330, O God, our help in ages past.
covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Please be seated. If through the fellowship, the liturgy, the hymns, the reading of scripture, the special music or the sermon, God has spoken to you and you desire to make a profession of faith, recommitment of life, become a member of this congregation, make a pledge or just to talk, please contact the minister or your elder to arrange an appointment. Our announcements, the board of managers meets on Tuesday the 13th September. Rev, is that in person? 4.30. 4.30 here in person. Bible study every Thursday at 5 p.m. I think we have a hybrid in person and on Zoom. Rebuilding fund, every, rebuilding fund collection every fourth Sunday. Youth meeting will soon be resuming. The choir has started practicing again as of yesterday. The formal opening of the Kirk is on Sunday, the 27th November at 3 p.m. Any other announcements? Yeah. Well, let me just start before Reverend James, just to say that the garden is coming along nicely and so are the weeds. Um, I'm trying to schedule some weeding sessions for this coming Saturday and the next one. Please, for volunteers or say. And your gardener help. She began. I saw a gentleman standing at the back, and I went to speak to him. Um, he's sitting right at the back there. Um, never met him before. And he said he came here on a mission um, that the Lord in the Spirit spoke to him and sent him to this church. Um, it's not just this church. I think you said it's about the third church you're doing. He's a series of church, yeah. The Holy Spirit has sent him to do evaluation of churches. And um, he didn't know our church, and um, the Lord gave him the direction. And he wasn't sure if it was the um, Anglican church up there, but the Lord told him it's the one closest to the hospital. He also said the Lord said to him that the church is small. And he um, said to me, he's not talking about the size of the, the church in terms of building. It's not even talking about the size of the people in the church, but the size of the church in the church. In other words, the number of people who... back to the churches. So we look forward to your feedback. And I meant to welcome you. I apologize. Um, not only are we seeing you for the first time, but you participated. Thank you. Any other announcements? Steve, the birthday you were talking about wasn't your birthday, right? What's her name? Oh. Oh, yes. Oh, we know you. Yeah, the mass. I could make it. Okay. Sorry, the mass does a lot of awful things. All right. Okay, well, let's peace on earth.
And I think we can start at least holding hands within families if we are afraid to join hands with everybody else. COVID did that to us. Thank you.